companies like the U.S. Uh, Soybean Export Council, uh, some agricultural investment firms as well. And John also has served, of course, as the head of the American Soybean Association's Washington office. He did that for more than 10 years and as a staff member at the U.S. Trade Representative's Office and at the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Agriculture. Please take time to welcome John Bays. <clears throat> Good morning to all of you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to uh, speak to you. This is sort of an issue of uh, a lot of importance to me on looking at yields. Uh, as I've said, I've been working in the soybean industry now for over 30 years, and one of the experiences that I've seen over the years is that if you go down south, uh, there's a lot of cotton farmers who grow soybeans. Uh, there are a lot of corn farmers in the Midwest who plant soybeans when they don't plant corn. Uh, and it's sort of, to a many respects, that's the way soybeans have been treated. They've been treated as that crop that you plant when you don't plant what you, what you call yourself. Uh, and it's sort of the secondary crop. Yet, uh, and I think for that reason, we've not seen soybean yields in many respects keep up with what we've seen in cotton and corn because uh, farmers tended to focus their management on those major crops that they, they considered most important. Yet I'm c always convinced that if you put as much management to soybeans as you do for the other uh, crops, we have seen a much better yields. And you see that, I look in states like North Carolina where they may only have a 32 bushel uh, state yield, but you got farmers that have got 55, 60 bushel yields who really focus their efforts on it. So I think it's, it's really important to have this conference. Now, the issue that I was brought into is that, okay, if we expand yields and we grow a lot more, we're going to be able to, to sell it at a price that makes us a profit. And over the years, I've heard enough from the times from farmers griping about checkoff investments saying, oh, don't spend it on production research. All you do is produce more and the price will go down. Uh, and, you know, that may have been a valid argument at one time when we're up to our behinds in uh, soybeans, but today in the, the world that it is today is a different uh, circumstances. So I want to show you uh, a little bit of a look at what's happened and where I think the world's going to go in the future. This is uh, a graph that I always like to start off with. It's the percentage change in global demand for wheat, corn, cotton, rice, and soybeans since 1990. And you'll look there, and the uh, soybean demand is up 147%. Corn's up 83%, wheat's up 22%. Now, explain that. Well, it's simple. Uh, soybean demand is a function of population, but rising per capita incomes. As people get more money in their pockets in the developing countries, they want to improve the quality of the diet, so they want more animal protein in the diet, and they want more vegetable oil in the diet. And if you're going to raise animals, whether it be uh, chickens, pigs, farm-raised fish, uh, you're going to need soybean meal because it's the preeminent protein source for uh, uh, animal feeds. Uh, so consumption rises for soybeans. And that's almost exclusively a result of global uh, economic uh, free market forces. Uh, corn's up 83 uh, percent, but most of that demand growth has occurred because of the ethanol sector in the United States. Um, the other commodities haven't seen the growth because in the case of wheat, uh, if you start improving your diets, you want to put some meat in the sandwich uh, so you don't want to eat as much bread as you did before. So demand for wheat's not growing at the same rate. So we've seen much greater growth in soybeans and I think we'll continue to see that growth in the future. Uh, this takes a look at the global supply demand for soybeans consumption and production. And you can see that production exceeded consumption over 11 years by just 1.5 percent. Some years we consume more than we produce and other years we produce more than we consume. And in some years like 2003-04 and 2008-09 consumption went down because it was a lack of supply. In fact, I could argue that demand would be greater in the world today if we'd had more to consume. Uh, but in fact, consumption in many respects has limited, been limited by supply. Uh, this is the annual growth in uh, global soybean consumption since uh, uh, 2000. You can see that uh, in two years there, in 03, 04, and uh, 08, 09, we saw a decline in consumption. In both cases, that was a result of, in 2003, a bad crop in the United States, and in 2008, 09, a bad crop in Argentina. So we, consumption went down because we didn't have the supply. Uh, 
uh, but in both cases, the following year saw record growth, uh, or almost record growth in consumption. So the world is growing at somewhere around 9, 10 million tons of consumption uh, over, the, over a period of time. And we're going to see a little slower growth this next, uh, the current marketing year because of economic problems in Europe uh, in particular. Uh, but we're still seeing strong growth. And for explanation, a, a, a metric ton is a 36.7 uh, bushels of soybeans. So when you're growing 10 million tons, you're growing 367 million bushels of soybeans uh, in a year. That's a lot. This is soybean production in the United States, Argentina, Brazil, and China. You can see the U.S. is still the largest producer in the world. And I think we will continue to be for some time, although ultimately we, there's no doubt that Brazil will probably pass us because they've got something we don't have, which is about 100 million acres of land that they ultimately can bring into production if the price is right. Uh, they've got the, the Chorados region in central Brazil that they can uh, clear the uh, savanna land there and plant soybeans. And if you put enough fertilizer on, enough lime on, you can grow soybeans. You spend a lot of money to get it out of there, but uh, to the coast because of distances, uh, but you can grow it. We've run out of land unless we start bringing CRP into production. And that's why if we're going to compete uh, in growing, su supplying global demand in the future, we've got to focus on yields. You can see that Argentina uh, is variable. Uh, I should say that uh, talked about the crop report this morning. One of the things that didn't, wasn't mentioned is that USDA cut the estimate for Brazil's crop this year from 72 million tons to 68 and a half million tons and it cut its estimate for Argentina from 48 million tons to 46 and a half million tons. That's 150 million bushels fewer soybeans uh, that's going to be produced in South America than we knew about yesterday. So that, I think, opens the opportunity uh, for better uh, prices out of the U.S. In fact, USDA raised the medium uh, or the average price for this marketing year by 30 cents a bushel this morning. Uh, that was the one significant change. But as you can see, uh, and in China, which is the uh, ancestral home of the soybean, its production continues to go down and reports yesterday that farmers in the major growing areas will probably plant more corn and fewer soybeans next year than, than last year. So we're t trending soybeans down in China. So here's soybean production by country uh, in the current marketing year, the estimates. Uh, U.S. 33 percent, Brazil 29, Argentina 19. Uh, then you sign China, India, Paraguay, and the other ones with Uruguay and a few other uh, places. If you want soybeans in the world of any volume, the places you have to go is the United States, Argentina, and Brazil. Here's U.S. soybean production. Uh, pretty flat, trending up, but uh, the problem for soybeans is, is they have to compete for land with corn and cotton, particularly corn. And, um, you know, from year to year, our, our weather is variable, so uh, yields will go up and down. But, uh, you know, we did have a record crop back in uh, 2009 at uh, 91.4 million metric tons, or about 3.3 billion bushels. Uh, and we still wound up with small carryover stocks at the end of that. Um, this is U.S. soybean harvested area. You see we had a record harvested area in 2010 and we dropped back this last year. Uh, there were, preliminarily people were talking about that we'd cut back again this year, but USDA raised its estimate back up to the same planted area as a year ago. I note yesterday that the new crop futures uh, corn, I mean soybean corn ratio uh, closed at 2.33 to 1. That with the current uh, prices for fertilizer and everything, I think will buy back some soybean acres from corn uh, because a lot of people say that 2.2 is neutral today. So I think we're going to see beans do better this next year or this uh, current year. This is corn and soybean planted area. As you can see, soybean area is flat over the last uh, 11 years, uh, only a million acres. Uh, and corn up 16.3 million acres. Now the fact that we've put enormous uh, 
incentives, subsidies into producing ethanol from corn is the main reason that's occurred because all, almost all of the growth in corn demand came in the U.S. Uh, and we'll, you know, that's why it's so hard for soybeans to compete for land. It will be interesting to see what happens in the next few years because uh, we've probably reached the blend wall on ethanol and the uh, uh, 45 cent a gallon ethanol uh, tax credit is gone. Uh, a lot of the ethanol plants today are struggling and several have uh, shut down at least temporarily. So we'll see what happens to uh, corn in the future. But today, you know, we're using more corn for ethanol in the U.S. than we're feeding animals and our, it's about 40 percent of production. This is Illinois plantings of corn and soybeans. You can see same things happened here. Your corn plantings have gone up and soybean plantings have gone down. Um, as we've seen the uh, uh, ethanol uh, factor in this marketplace and higher prices for corn. You know, it's, it's not exactly, if you hear the, some people say, oh, Brazil's just going to grow, 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 grow. Well, you notice there that in 07, 08, and 09, they actually, plantings were down below where they were before because prices were low. Uh, transportation costs in Brazil were very high, and farmers actually cut back their plantings of soybeans. They will do that when they find out it's not economical. You'll say, well, what did they plant instead? They didn't plant is what happened. If you can't make money, uh, uh, you can't cover your variable costs for producing and transporting it to the coast, why would you plant the crop? And that's what happens in, in the, far, the most distant areas. Argentina's continued to grow, but I think they've topped out. Uh, today, Argentina is planting 40 percent more land to soybeans than all other crops combined. That's because of a crazy thing with their tax policy, their uh, export restrictions and whatever. The only crop that farmers have trusted planting that they might get a good price for uh, is soybeans. I think in the future, if the Argentine government gets its head out of its behind and starts allowing a rational policy, and I think they will, uh, then we'll start seeing corn plantings go up substantially because the farmers in Argentina want to plant corn. They know that they're planting soybeans uh, uh, too, too often without rotations and they're going to get into disease problems. So I think we'll see Argentina top out and probably go down in, uh, in its uh, harvested area in the next few years, particularly if China starts going into Argentina big time to buy corn. Uh, so we'll see with that. This is global soybean meal consumption. You can see that we only had two years in that period when we saw a decline in consumption. It's again as a result of a lack of supply. But we're continuing to grow consumption. And I always point to soybean meal because soybeans are called an oil seed. They are. They produce about 11.3 uh, 11 pounds of oil per bushel. But they are mainly a protein seed because it's the demand for soybean meal that drives the demand for soybeans. You're not going to crush soybeans for oil and store the meal because you can't store it very long and second you don't have a place to put it. So you always crush your meal and you, if you have a surplus oil you can store it. So it's soybean meal that drives the market for soybeans. Here's global soybean consumption by region and you can see that the big areas East Asia and that is China, Korea, uh, Japan and Taiwan plus Hong Kong. Uh, that's the largest area and that's mostly China. Then the next one is, uh, is North America, U.S., uh, Canada and Mexico. Then the European Union at 18 percent. And then you go over to uh, South America which is uh, Brazil primarily uh, in consumption. And then Southeast Asia which is a very rapidly growing area which is uh, um, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and Singapore uh, is a, a good growth area. Uh, we're seeing some growth in the Middle East um, and we're getting to see fairly good growth in South Asia which is primarily India. Here's the big one that's had the effect. This is the imports of soybeans by China in the blue and imports of soybeans by every other country in the world in red. China has been the player, the driver of the global market 
since the, around 1990. In fact, let me show you this. This is uh, uh, the world's largest soybean meal consumers today. You'll see that China is by far the largest, followed by Europe, then the United States, and then Brazil, and you go down to smaller lots. But you can see a lot of those places are in Asia, and it's been Asia that's driving the demand. Here's the graph that I think is one of the telling graphs of all time. It uh, shows soybean meal consumption from 1970 to the current day in China. And you look at that and you say, what the hell happened in 1990? Anybody can tell me what happened in 1990, 1989? Tiananmen Square, 1989, China almost had a revolution on its hands. It had the students and others who took over Tiananmen Square in Beijing, and they had generals that were, wouldn't t attack them. They had people in their major uh, Politburo that were supporting the top people. And it was about people saying, what's in it for us? We want more control. So at that point, a decision was made within China that they had to change their economic policy. And they sort of followed a Singapore model. They decided to allow in foreign investment. They decided to adopt capitalist policies. So uh, not long after that, Deng Xiaoping, the then uh, premier, said to be rich is glorious. And so now we've got all this entrepreneurship. Created. China's one big uh, uh, cauldron of entrepreneurship. They started creating jobs. They started creating businesses. People started getting more money in their pocket. They started saying, I can afford some chicken meat. I can afford more pork. I can eat some more fish. And you grew demand internally within China because of internal gro economic growth. And it's worked to satisfy the people. You go to China today, yes, there are problems all over the place. Maybe 150,000 demonstrations a year, protests a year in China. It's a big place. And you don't see about them, but uh, see, uh, read about them, but they're there. But on, overall, the people of China are happier today. You go there and the cities are prosperous. Uh, cities, the people are, look like they're healthy. They look like life is better. Now, that's the problem for China is, is that when you turn, unleash that opportunity and create that better life for people, they don't expect it to turn around and go back the other way. So in respect, I always consider China's leadership to the people of China is similar to a 150-pound man to a 600-pound tiger walking through, uh, where the, the, the uh, man has a, a leash around the tiger's neck. And they start out across the desert. Now, the man may think he's leading the tiger, but the tiger's 600 pounds. He's 150. So ultimately, he's going to go where the tiger wants to go. And the first thing on his mind every day is feed that sucker before he, before he eats you. Uh, so the Chinese people today are, in fact, the tiger. The government of China is essentially the 150-pound person who's every day is worrying about keeping that tiger, uh, people happy or they'll turn on the government of China. And as a result, that's what we've seen and why I expect to continue to see economic growth in China continue Otherwise, they'll have a political uh, uh, upheaval. And I think over time, over, it'll take many years, but China will move toward a dem democratic policies because uh, that's what the people ultimately demand. Here's China's vegetable oil imports and, I mean, uh, and consumption. They are by far the world's veg the largest vegetable oil consumer today, and they are the largest importer of vegetable oils in the world. India is... Uh, that strange situation, very poor people, protein deficient, and it's a substantial soybean meal exporter. Why wouldn't that protein be consumed domestically? Well, the people don't have money. But that's changing. Their chicken industry is beginning to grow rapidly, seven, eight, ten percent a year. And you see in the red there that soybean meal consumption is continuing to go up. And I think five, six, seven years, China, I mean, India will no longer be exporting soybean meal. And that's important to all of you because they export their meal from October through March or April, exactly when we should be exporting soybean meal when we're most competitive. If you pull them out of the market, we will get a lot of that business 
coming back to the United States. But this is important because by 2035, India's population will exceed that of China's. And they're having 7 and 8% economic growth rate. You know, I, uh, when I was many years ago, people said, oh, the Indians will never eat uh, much meat. They're all Hindus, and you know, Hindus aren't supposed to eat uh, uh, meat. And I said, yeah, and I grew up in Texas with a lot of Baptists who aren't supposed to drink. Uh, and so uh, they will, uh, you find out, give them some money, they'll eat some chicken. Uh, the, this is India's veg oil consumption and imports. You can see how fast their consumption of veg oils are growing. And that's because when prices got high, they had to take their import tariffs off of oil. And that lowered the price and the people are uh, growing prosperity, starting seeing more and more oil consumption. Uh, so, uh, and now they're importing a whole lot of vegetable oil. It's mostly palm oil from Southeast Asia, but it's still growing. And I expect that to continue to grow in the future. This is global soybean oil consumption. Again, like soybean meal, we had a couple of years when consumption didn't uh, grow every year. But overall, it's growing worldwide every year. Here's why. This one shows global consumption of veg oil, all veg oils for food and feed in the uh, blue and industrial products in the red. Industrial products is biodiesel primarily, but it's also uh, plastics, it's in, um, you know, foams uh, for the car seats, uh, all kinds of different products and companies want to go green. So, but you can see that we've grown consumption for industrial products from 9.2 million tons to 34.6 million tons in, a, in a, uh, 11 years. Uh, and the demand's up overall 70% in 11 years for vegetable oil. This is global vegetable oil stock to use ratio, and this is a pretty crucial item. It tells you at the end of the year how big is the pile of or the, uh, oil you got, the tanks of oil you got, relative to what you consume that year. And you can see that the trend is down. We're reaching critical levels to where if you have a bad South, uh, Southeast Asian palm crop, a bad European rapeseed crop, or a bad Canadian rapeseed crop, or a South American or U.S. bad soybean crop, you've got shortage of oil and prices go through the roof. Uh, so we're seeing that trend line going down. 8.1% is a very small stock to use ratio. And it's got a lot of people's concern. And what's happened is that we really increased that demand for biodiesel. Uh, so what will the future demand breed? Uh, as I said, demand for soybeans, soybean meal, and soybean oil is pri driven primarily by three things. Population, per capita income, and energy prices. As the population rises, so does demand for food. Everybody's got to eat. As incomes rise in developing countries, per capita consumption of animal protein and veg oil increases. Just a fact. It's just almost linear with rising income. The other thing, strangely, that grows at the same rate is paper consumption. Because uh, I guess some people want to wrap their meat in something. I'm not sure. But uh, the higher energy prices rise, the greater the demand for alternative fuels such as biodiesel. Those are the three things that drive it. So what's the future going to hold? World population. Um, this is Census Bureau. Uh, you can see that uh, we're probably today around six and a half billion. They expect that to go to nine plus billion by 2050 uh, in the global population. So we're talking about adding two and a half, three billion people. Uh, to the global uh, population. Now that assumes, of course, that one, we don't have pandemics, uh, we don't have nuclear wars, we don't have uh, a lot of other things, and that we've got food to feed them. But <clears throat> others will tell you that this is going to level off in population down the road. Uh, we'll see. But I think it will be, we, we'll know this, the more education and the more income people have, the fewer number of ch children they have. Um, here's the top 10 countries to add 422 million people this decade. Look at that list. India is going to add 153 million people in a 10 years. China, 54 million people. And this is a scary one. Ethiopia, of all places, 
37% uh, uh, growth in population in 10 years. They can't feed themselves now, but they're going to have 37% growth in population. The USA, we're going to add, according to this, 30 million. Um, Pakistan, 27 million. The Congo, 25 million. Bangladesh, 23 million. And Brazil, 21 million. Now, what's sort of scary to me is if you look at India, China, Pakistan, uh, all three are right there nestled together. They don't like each other and all have nukes. So we'll see if we make it 10 years with all that population growth because they're all competing for the same resources uh, in that region. This is the other part. This is the projected population breakdown by ages in 2025. 56% of the population of India will be eight, under the age of 40, and a high percentage of them will be under the age of 30 or 25. Those people are growing, eating, the high, most productive time in their life probably, uh, and when they're consuming the most food. That looks great if you're trying to create a social security system because you got all those people down at the bottom paying in for not many people at the top. But it's lousy if you're trying to feed a country. So that's going to be a real challenge for India. If you look at China, it's much more top loaded because they have the one child policy. Their population actually will shrink in the future and it'll be become too many people at the top, not enough people at the bottom. So I think that's a, a real ch another challenge for them. This is projected growth in per capita income from 2010 to 2030. They say we're going to go from $42,500 to $60,000 in the U.S. South Korea is going to double. Russia, uh, double. Mexico, almost double. Japan, thirty-four to $48,000. India, look at that, tripling per capita income. Uh, in the, uh, the older western portion and 19,000 in the east. Then you got China growing from $2,800 per capita to 12,600. So why would you not think that per capita consumption is going to continue to grow up in China with all that growth in per capita income? People are going to spend it. And in Canada, uh, Canucks are going to do very well up there. They're going to have per capita income exceeding us in the United States. And then you got Brazil that's doubling. Those are ones, if those countries see that growth in per capita income, I mean, in per capita income, we're going to see continued strong growth in demand for meat, milk, eggs, and vegetable oil, which will all create demand for soy. Uh, this, take a look at China. What's happened is their per capita incomes have grown. Their pork uh, per capita consumption up in the last decade by 22.6%, chicken meat up by 36.5%. So uh, we know it's going to happen. The Chinese eat a lot of meat today. This is the, uh, the impact of a changing uh, crude oil prices on uh, agricultural commodities. The higher the energy price, the higher the value of that commodity to do nothing other than burn it. So if we see high energy prices, you're going to see higher commodity prices because somebody at some point will say, I'm going to burn it instead of eating it because I make more money. So the long-range projections, this is USDA issued these about two weeks ago. US, uh, for U.S. soybean production, it's supposed to go from 3.06 uh, uh, billion bushels in 2011-12 up to 3.73 billion bushels. That's not much of a growth over a decade. U.S. long-range projections for global soybean exports. Uh, you can see them, soybean meal, soybean oil, and soybeans going up. Uh, beans going up from 92 million tons to 131. Uh, and then you've got meal from going up from 60 million tons up to 70 million tons, and oil from 8.6 to 11.1. That's what they're projecting over the next decade. I should point out that whenever USDA issues these projections every year, they're instantly wrong. But uh, because they'll be, nobody can project the future two, one year in advance, no less ten. But still, they're worthwhile guideposts to look at. This is long-range projections for China soybean imports. They say they're going to go from 55.5 million tons this year to 88.3 million tons 
in a decade. They're going to continue to grow. Here's projected soybean, uh, soy and soybean product exports from the U.S., Argentina, Brazil, and other countries. You can see that we're going to grow by about 6.4 million tons, they say. Brazil by 12.6 and Argentina by 12.6. I don't believe that Argentina will be able to grow by 12.6 because I think their actual production of soybeans may go down. But nevertheless, that's what USDA is projecting. The point there is that we're the largest soybean producer in the world and we're not going to participate in the growth at the rate of our competitors. That's why we have to increase yields because we're probably not going to add area. Here is my way of projecting the future, plain and simple. I could use it, I'm using 2000 to 2011 estimates, but I can go back and get the other one, which is 1990 up to now. You have uh, the blue dots are what we've actually consumed every year, and then I had the computer uh, shoot a trend line through that and then project it out to a decade in the future. In either way you slice it, it says we're going to need 70 million tons of additional soybean production in a decade to meet demand. Now, what's 70 million tons? Well, Brazil's the second largest producer in the world, and the USDA says it's going to produce 68 and a half. We have to add another Brazil to the global supply in the next decade to meet demand. You can do it by cutting down a lot more rainforest in Brazil, or you can expand yields. I prefer expanding yields because I think it's much more positive for the environment. Now, let's look at just a couple slides here. This is all the way average corn and soybean yields. Um, you can see that uh, variable on corn, much more variable uh, than on soybeans over the last decade. This is ratio of average corn and soybean yields. You'll see that's interesting is that contrary to what a lot of people say, at least based on USDA data, for the state as a whole, the relationship between corn yields and bean yields are the same. And the gross revenue per, uh, is slightly, uh, looks like it's slightly growing relative uh, to, in favor of corn, but not a whole lot. And in the national average, yields don't seem to be favoring corn in the ratio, but they seem to be favoring corn in the gross revenue per acre. So the question is the bottom line. Ready? Soybean yields need to increase to allow the crop to compete for land versus corn. Bottom line, you all guys will make choices here, uh, and you're going to look at it and say, which one's going to make me the most money? And also bring in the need to rotate now and then. But, you know, I think a lot of farmers uh, over the years decided, you know, I like uh, a 50 50 corn bean rotation, I'm going to stay with it. Others have said, particularly with cash rents where they are, I have to maximize that income this year, so I'm going to plant more corn. Uh, but ultimately, we get into trouble, as a lot of farmers found out in the last year, that corn after corn really gives you a hit on yields in many cases. Uh, so we need, but we need to make sure that soybeans can compete, and the way to do that is get yields up. Uh, we, Illinois and U.S. average yields need to increase to allow the U.S. compete for future growth and demand. I'm pretty nationalistic. I like to see us go out and fight in the world and compete and win. I want to be the one that gets a big chunk of the growth in the world uh, market in the future. Because if that's occurring, you're making money doing it. And I think that's one of the things of why you need to increase yields. Uh, in my opinion, we ought to set as a goal to increase national average yields five bushels an acre over the next five years and ten bushels an acre over the next ten years. That's not that ambitious. That's a 25% growth, less than a 25% growth in yields over the next 10 years. And I am convinced as hell you can do it if you use the technology that exists today and manage beans as aggressively as you do your other crops. It's there. Pick a good variety, put the fertilizer, chemicals, whatever you need to, and manage it as well, you can get the yields. The technology exists to do it. What is needed is as farmers to use it, as I see it. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I think I've set up, hopefully, from your standpoint, what we need, I mean, the opportunity is there in the future to sell your crop. You're going to be able to do it at a good price. And I believe also you're going to be able to do it uh, at a, uh, uh, with the technology exists and it's only, and the technology is only going to improve in the next decade. Yeah, thank you very much.